Hi there, I'm Matt Eland, and I want to talk to you today about visualizing code. Now, there's this idea I came across maybe 20 years ago or so in a book that I've long since forgotten, but it had this idea that we can visualize code and we can view our source code as really just information. And you think about a, a Git-based project system, which we'll talk a little bit more about if you're unfamiliar later on, uh, but a Git system is just a series of changes that have been made to your project to uh, one or more files. Now, uh, a couple years ago, I uh, tried to visualize this. Uh, what I did is I went into a product called Jupyter Notebooks, which lets you write Python code or R code and see your results in line. And I made a number of visualizations and I really liked this project. And I went on to the CodeMash conference in 2022 and I presented it there. Uh, this talk was really well regarded. It was generally appreciated. It had some very experimental visuals, we'll say, uh, but I never gave it again. And the reason why is because there's this thing nagging me in the back of my head. It was this audience question of how do I get started? And what I found was that I really hadn't set people up for success in order to replicate the steps that I'd done. I, I was able to do this as a programmer who was very deeply familiar with the, the domain, but nobody else could. And so I didn't think that the project was without merit. I thought there was a lot of insight that could be offered to engineering managers and people in the open source community in particular. And so I took the opportunity to you know, really just try again. So this project here is a second attempt at visualizing code. And I'm gonna be focusing today on a open source project run by Microsoft called Polyglot Notebooks. Now, you may have heard of this project previously as .NET Interactive. Last November, they actually rebranded this from .NET Interactive to Polyglot Notebooks. Uh, but what Polyglot Notebooks is all about is about taking interactive notebooks like we had in Jupyter Notebooks and adding in more and more features. So specifically, you can write C Sharp or F Sharp code and execute that directly in your notebook. Now, it's not just C Sharp either though. Uh, because Polyglot Notebook supports C Sharp, F Sharp, PowerShell, Java, <laughs> PowerShell, JavaScript, SQL, uh, Cusco Query Language, HTML Mermaid diagrams, and then your normal Python R and, and, and Markdown. So there's a lot of built-in capabilities, and what's even cooler is that some of these languages, you can share the data between uh, cells of different languages. Now, I'm not going to be talking to you about... Uh, Polyglot notebooks today in much depth. Uh, there's some other contents I have that are that are around that. But today I want to talk to you about the visualizing code aspects of looking over the Polyglot notebook repository. Now, let's talk about the data sources I used in this project. Now, there are no custom data sources out there for this repository. Instead, I'm viewing the repository itself as a collection of data. Now, my high-level approach was to take a Git repository that I had cloned down to my machine, so I'd really just downloaded it onto my machine, and it has all the history and files in my machine. I then wrote some Python code that's going to extract commit history from that file, and also extract information about the files and their sizes that are present in the latest version of the code. Now, all these things flew into uh, five different comma-separated value files, with the last two of those files really being the ones that were suitable for analysis workflow. So I'll walk you through my steps and how I got there, and then we'll take a look at the code and well, I'll take a look at the visuals and see how it flows. Okay, so uh, this all runs in a Jupyter notebook using Python. Okay, Python uh, it works really well in a Jupyter notebook, and what I'm doing is I'm setting up a number of different variables like, hey, where is this thing on disk? Uh, what are the files that should be involved? Uh, where do I want to write everything out to? How many maximum threads should be involved in this for performance reasons? And then I, I, I let my notebook run. And the first thing my notebook runs is it goes out and it looks to see what are the commits in this local repository. Now, any Git repository has a .git folder on your machine. So even if you don't have connection to the internet, you still have the full history of that project there. And this history composes of different commits by different authors throughout the, the course of the project. And each commit modifies one or more files. Okay? So I had a lot of information just from each individual commit, such as what files were modified, who did the modification, when did it occur, how many lines were added, how many lines were deleted, what commit message was present, that sort of thing. And I used a library called PyDriller, which is an open source library in Python, to pull out this information. Now, this really wound up being my weakest link because pulling the information from PyDriller took uh, anywhere from 0.2 to 0.8 seconds per commit, which on a very large project, which has thousands of commit, 
well, you're now waiting a number of minutes just to get your results. Now, I can mix together these, these two data sources. I can say, hey, uh, I really would like to augment my file information with information about the file in general. What's the extension of this, this file that we're committing to? How large is this file? That kind of thing. And so I was able to combine those two sources to have kind of this file commit plus file data data source, which I called merged file commits dot comma separated value. Now, I kind of flipped this a little bit and I did the same thing with each individual file. So now I, I, I had some aggregate level information on each file, such as the number of commits that are associated with it, who made the first commit, who made the latest commit, um, who the most frequent author was, you know, things like that. Now, these two final data sources, these, these merge files, commits, and file, uh, file data CSV, this was what I ultimately used for analysis. And the other three files were really just there to fuel these two final byproducts. Now, there are some limitations of this approach, however. This, again, only works with Git repositories. This also, right now, most critically, doesn't track files that have been moved or renamed. It sort of loses the historical context as maybe the most critical flaw to the accuracy of the data. Um, this is most accurate if you haven't done a lot of renaming or moving. I'm working on this problem, but in its current form, I do have that limitation. Also, PyDriller is very slow to look at these repositories and these commits. Uh, Python is not a very performant language by default. And so I am looking to see what I can do to make this, you know, closer to instantaneous than, uh, hey, I'm going to set this and walk the dock and come back and see if it's finished yet. Okay. But this is a very effective uh, thing. And so let's take a look at a sample set of findings from me looking at the uh, Polygon Notebooks uh, source control repository. So the first thing I want to ask myself is when, how active is this project? It, when has this project been busy? Uh, is this project right now still chaotic? Is this having some issues? Is this uh, dwindling off of support? Not many people are working on it anymore. You know, what stage of a project are we in? And Polyglot Notebooks had its kind of um, areas of instability uh, where there were a lot of um, frantic changes going on that was um, really down here in the, uh, in the around 2020, uh, it had a lot of chaos going on as it was building out, and now it's sort of resolved into, you know, not as many commits going on, and the the net lines of code, uh, the the inserts plus the uh, or the inserts minus the deletions, is trending towards zero. So this is this is helping us see that this is a more stable code base that's still getting a lot of active commits each month. Um, and so we can see this is, this is actually a fairly healthy code base that's maybe more in production mode right now or pre-production mode. Uh, they're really in pr uh, preview right now. Uh, another view on this uh, here just highlights the individual uh, inserts and deletes. And we, can do, we do see that we have a spike of, of inserts as new files were added and a spike of deletes as roughly 200,000 files were removed uh, back in 2020. Uh, Incidentally, the commit uh, message associated with this one was called like the purge or something like that. It was, it was, it was pretty funny to look at that and, and uh, uh, get the insights of what was going on there. Now, uh, another healthy factor for a open source project is how many people are working on this in any given time. And so I charted out the unique authors per month and you can see in the beginning, there really weren't a whole lot of people working on this project at once, but then it kicked into high gear and a lot of people were active on this. And then it started dwindling down again. And then around last year, we started seeing a, a new life in this project and more and more people kept working on it. Microsoft invested more and more developers, more teams, and this thing is really taking off. And especially it's been getting a lot more press recently. And so more and more people are wanting to contribute to this project. And if, as an open source project, you know, anybody is welcome to contribute, which is awesome. Now, uh, I always like to look at outliers uh, in the commits. And so I charted out the uh, the individual commits based on the number of uh, additions and uh, deletions uh, that were going on. And usually you'll, you'll see a lot of outliers. We do see a couple of outliers here. So we have this, this commit over here that has a lot of uh, additions and this commit over here, which represents the purge uh, where a lot of files were deleted. But most of these commits are really trending towards this, uh, this middle ground of I'm not going to be adding um, a whole lot of code or deleting a whole lot of code. So very, very stable in general. Though we do have a scattering of, of, of large uh, inserts and deletions. Uh, but frankly, uh, I've looked at a number of projects and this, this has a lot less chaos than a, a lot of those other projects do. You see a lot more of the uh, 
the high degree of, of inserts and deletions in other projects. Now, if we look at the individual commits uh, in the system and you see like, hey, how many files and, and how, many times, uh, how many times per month is a person committing? Uh, we do see that we have a lot of people um, who are who are kind of this infrequent committers, um, a very healthy range. This is common for most projects, especially open source projects. But then you have the people wearing capes. You, know, you have your superheroic people who, who are maybe getting up into the uh, 50 commits a month uh, at, at times. Actually, I believe this is weekly commit data. So this is this is some some very serious full time work on the project. Um, and you can filter out the infrequent contributors and just get it down to the, the top five or six committers. And it largely remains, you know, fairly the same. The time range changes a little bit. Uh, but we see that we have uh, Diego Colombo in particular, uh, these green markers, is just prolific in the project. Now, he's starting to, try to, to commit less and less as time goes on, but other people are, are taking on uh, where he's left off. So um, this is a project that's that's ha does have its key contributors who are contributing, but it also has a lot of people who are just uh, contributing little things where they can, and that's really healthy. Uh, but you also want to look at how is this changing over time. We saw that a little bit with the bubble graph, but um, we can take a look at this table, this heat map here. And we can see, okay, well, we do have some people here who contribute a lot, and uh, Diego in particular has contributed quite a bit over the over time. But he's maybe starting to uh, to commit a little bit less, at least uh, in in Q uh, Q1 of 2023. Now, Diego may uh, <laughs> may turn that around, uh, may come back and work on the project heavily, but he doesn't necessarily have to, according to this graph, because we have a lot of work coming through with John and Brett and uh, you know a few new people who have just joined up on this project uh, who are very uh, contributing a, a lot already. So this is a healthy project that's getting new blood into it and also you know, people are continuing to contribute over time, you know, many years at this point, which is great. So let's take a look at the code and see what trends we can find from the code. The first thing I like to look at is what type of files are in this project. And we see we have a whole lot of C sharp files. Uh, these blue CS files are for C sharp projects or C sharp files. And this doesn't surprise me for a project built around uh, .NET and helping people uh, use .NET to manage their polyglot notebooks. Um, but you also see a smattering of other languages. We have, you know, F sharp. Uh, we have a number of Jupyter notebooks up here. Uh, there are some shell scripts over here. Uh, and then uh, the documentation lives over here. And we do see some smattering of things uh, sort of intermixed uh, as well. So this is a fairly unsurprising graph, but it really highlights the, the wealth of languages used in a project uh, called Polyglot Notebooks, which is not at all surprising. So I always like to look at what files are big, because usually you'll have a couple files that are just way bigger than they ought to be. Uh, and uh, you try to see what is our largest file and why is it our largest file? Uh, in this case, our largest file here in terms of lines of code is this Jupyter Notebook. Now, Jupyter Notebooks are not files that you're going to be looking at the individual lines of code. They're actually kind of a visual thing. So I don't mind a large file, and Jupyter Notebooks tend to be large anyway. So uh, this red flag here is actually not a red flag at all for me. Now, we do have a couple files that are, you know, around 1,600 lines of code, and that's starting to wrinkle my nose a little bit when I look at them, uh, at fi those files in general, at, at files in general of that size. But none of this is we need to stop production now and uh, and fix these things because these are out of hand. Uh, I start hitting the panic button around 2,000 lines of code or, or higher, and we're not there yet. This is actually maybe the first project I've ever looked at that didn't have those glaring alarm bells in it, which is really great. Um, and one of the things you might notice about these files, these large files in particular, is that they are changed frequently. So I looked and see, hey, what are the files that change the most? Because any project has files that, that change very infrequently and files that change you know, fairly frequently. And what I found is we have a couple of files here that change uh, fairly frequently. That would be our command line processor or parser and our kernel extensions files. Uh, and we also have the readme file, which actually changes with every commit, which I, I have never quite seen that pattern in another repository before. Uh, but I believe that's something either automated or part of the team's process uh, to build a change log, uh, for example. Uh, so this is a very healthy code base where you don't see uh, too, too many highlights and, and hotspots. Uh, we might want to consider breaking out this large file, this large file into multiple other files if we can. That might be refactoring targets we can look at. Uh, but again, I've not looked at the actual source code, just these metrics. So one of the things I like to look at is, is what areas of the project are the most 
active. And I'm, I'm looking at the errors here based on their subdirectories. And this project has a, lo a lot more sub uh, subdirectories than many other uh, projects I've looked at. Uh, but we can see that most of the code is going towards this, uh, this .NET interactive. Um, the tests are getting a lot of uh, activity, which is great. You always like to see tests getting, uh, getting love. And then the C Sharp uh, handling and formatting, uh, all of this stuff really makes sense. And then you have a lot of other things that are kind of supporting uh, work. Um, so this makes sense to me that, that these would be the files that are most frequently changed. And we can see from the shading here that they are changed really year in, year out. There's no um, large patterns, at least in the top of three or four rows here. Um, but one of the things that did surprise me is I like to look at, let's see, hey, what's the average age of these files? So how, how many days have, has each file gone before it's been changed last? And what I found is most files in the system have actually been changed really, really recently. And this makes me think that these files were probably renamed or moved as the uh, folder organization was, was changed, because generally you don't see this kind of a uh, universal uh, styling of things. Um, if uh, if a project wasn't uh, affected by a, a uh, I'm going to modify almost every file in the system kind of approach. You do see some files that have uh, lived on for years without being modified, and these are you know your very stable files, and these tend to be your smaller files as well. Uh, but it is surprising to me to see that uh, so many of these files have been modified so recently. And so I decided to say, hey, how many files on average are modified for each commit? And um, you know, usually you'd like that to be very low, and we do see that the vast majority are, you know, uh, 10 commits, uh, 10 files or less per commit, um, which is good. Um, but we do see we have a number of, of commits that affect, uh, you know, a, a larger number of files, uh, which is what you'd expect for something that would affect things in entire directories or subsystems or uh, things matching that. But that is a rarity for the project, which is great. Now, another thing I like to look at is I like to say, hey, who knows the most about this project? Who, if I want to talk to somebody about uh, the, the pending progress area and the areas around that, uh, who would I talk to? And in this case, uh, that's going to be Diego Colombo, which is actually the case for uh, most of the system, about half the system. Uh, Diego is the most frequent contributor to those files. But we do see a couple other individuals really kind of stepping up. We see uh, that Brett... And, uh, and and John uh, are both uh, contributing quite a bit to the project uh, with these kind of teals and light blues, uh, and you have a couple specialists who are working really in a lot of a lot of key areas. So here, uh, Justin Chen, I believe, did a lot of work around uh, F sharp, if I recall, and then this gold over here uh, is Charles Gagnon. And he uh, did a lot of work with uh, SQL, for example. So um, those are specialists you might find and talk to about those areas. And these other three individuals are really working everywhere in the system. And that's actually something that really struck me about this project, is if I look at what area individuals are contributing to from our key contributors, I see that there really isn't like a, a very strong trend of individuals to stay in one area of specialization. Uh, this is a, a project where everyone is kind of working on the major areas together instead of saying, hey, this is my silo, this is your silo. This is a really, really healthy trend. I've actually not seen anything quite as healthy from all the projects that I've looked at over my career, which is um, really nice. Uh, kudos to the team. Now, uh, when I'm looking at this, I said, well, okay, well, how many authors does each individual file have? And uh, what I found is that most files have, you know, five to 10 uh, authors at least. Uh, there are very rare files that have, you know, three or fewer authors throughout their lives. These tends to be the, the smaller files that don't change very often. And there's one file that basically has everybody on it, uh, the README markdown. If you are committing to this project, you are modifying the README markdown. And again, this is a really healthy uh, environment to be in because you don't want to have files that are big and important and frequently changed that not many people are touching because this way uh, people can leave the project, get promoted, move to different organizations entirely, uh, and your project is still able to survive them even if they were a major contributor to your project. So in conclusion, I do believe this is a very healthy project and let me tell you why. Well, first of all, this, uh, the commits are now in a very stable sort of a, uh, a pattern. We have a lot of frequent commits, the activity is picking up, but the net lines of code are remaining close to zero or, or slightly positive. This is really good. We have some key contributors that contribute each month, and we also have a lot of new blood into these projects that are just starting to help out, right? Um, 
the authors on the project is increasing and the chaos doesn't appear to be increasing to match it. So this is a project that's doing really, really, really well. Now, the code is also appears to be doing really, really well just by looking at these metrics for uh, file sizes, commit frequencies, uh, authors per commit, thing, uh, authors per file, things like that. Now, I'm not looking at the actual source code. There's tools out there that will help you that with that, such as uh, code analysis built into Visual Studio or more professional tools such as uh, Independ or Sonar Cloud, Sonar Cube, things like that. But what I am seeing is that there's a lot of really good activity around this stuff. Uh, and we can look at the different areas of the project and see which ones are working and which ones are not working. And uh, frankly, they're all really working. I, I've not seen a project quite this this uh, strong, and I'm really excited about this. So uh, Polyglot Notebooks is obviously on a very good path. I'm excited to be writing and, and working more with it in the future. I may even contribute code myself. But what's next for my data analysis approach? Well. In the short term, I want to add in uh, Python code visualizations uh, just for people who don't have Tableau. I also want to document more of my approach with, tab uh, with Tableau and the process of generating data uh, itself. I also want to, to see how this works in Power BI, document that process as well, uh, so that people can start get, to get value out of this. That's my short term plans for this. Medium term plans, I want to address some of my critical issues, such as the performance issue. I want to address the issue with renaming files. And I want to do that by re rewriting this in .NET and more formally in integrated polyglot notebooks with my analysis workflow. Now, that's my medium term. Long term, I'd love to see this living as a standalone desktop application or something that integrates into your editor, such as Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, or any of the JetBrains IDEs. Uh, I also see a lot of people in the community really still liking Excel, and I'd like to see what I can do to help them out. So, How do you get started if you want to get started with this? Well, uh, you can go out to getstractor.com, and that will redirect you to my uh, repository, and you can see really what we're working with there. If you have any questions on this, please leave me a comment or send me an email, and I'd be happy to talk through my approach and hear what your needs are uh, with your projects. But uh, thank you for your time and attention.